They take on huge amounts of risks because they get the upside. And if the risk turns out badly, they walk away, which is exactly what happened with the banks. So the incentive structure is all messed up because of what? Because of free markets? Free markets would let Freddie and Fannie at some point, toward, just before they failed, had a, uh, were leveraged. They had a debt to equity ratio, a debt to capital ratio of close to 1,000 to 1. That can't exist in a free market. Nobody would lend an institution with a debt to equity ratio like that. Nobody would lend them a dime. You try go out there and ask a bank for a loan and say, you know, I'll put in one dollar, you put in a thousand. <laughs> it ain't happening. You know, 80, 20, maybe, but that one to a thousand just doesn't. That can only happen with a government run institution. The uh, investment bankers were 30 to 1. How could they get 30 to 1? Ratios, because they were protected too big, too big to fail. So government was everywhere in this crisis, everywhere. And if you really want to see the culprit in what happened, you know, all you have to do is look at the Federal Reserve. We don't like recessions in this com country. They're painful. People lose their jobs. It's unpleasant. So, you know, Alan Greenspan came up with a solution. Every time there's a threat of a recession, you flood the markets with money, and you try to smooth it out. They even talked about smoothing out the business cycle and soft landings and never having too many problems, never having too many. So in 2002, we lowered interest rates to below the rate of inflation. We call that in finance positive, negative real rates of return. What happens when you have negative real rates of return? You're basically paying people to borrow money. What happens when you pay people to borrow money? They borrow money. So everybody borrowed money. We borrowed money on our homes, on our credit cards, on our companies. Everybody borrowed money. And the incentives were there. You could borrow it at nothing, close to nothing. And all we did is build up a credit bubble, a huge bubble of overly extended debt that all of us took on, all of us who took on the debt. So, you know, this, you know, you could argue about the details and derivatives and CDOs and CDSs if, if only the people who talked about them actually knew what they meant. And you know, you can talk about all these things, but you cannot, cannot, cannot blame capitalism for this crisis. You cannot blame free markets for Were there players that misbehaved? Were there people on Wall Street that did really dumb things? Were there crooks in the mortgage market that did really corrupt things? Yes. And if you're a crook, go to jail. But to blame markets after government had its fingers in every aspect of the system is ludicrous. And yet, this is what we do every single time there's an economic problem. And it's not even that new. If you go back, you can go back in the last 2,000 years, every time there's a, there's a crisis, you know, it used to be that you'd blame the Jewish bankers. You, you can't say Jewish anymore and, you know, and blame them. It's not politically correct. You just blame the bankers today, right? But it's the same phenomenon. You always blame bankers and markets. And in modern times, you always blame capitalism. I mean, every economist today, every honest economist today, understands that the, that the uh, Great Depression was caused by bad Federal Reserve policy and by horrific policies by the Hoover administration and then FDR. This is not a secret. Even relatively left-wing economists get that. It's just too well documented for them to evade it to that extent. And yet, in our schools and everywhere else, we are taught that the crisis was caused by capitalism and that FDR saved us from it, even though anybody who can read numbers can see that unemployment when FDR started and unemployment when FDR before World War II, just before World War II broke in 39, were the same pretty much. Nothing happened. He did nothing to save us. You know, and war certainly doesn't save you from recessions. It doesn't count when you ship half the male population overseas in terms of reducing unemployment. That's cheap. <laughs> right. So why? The biggest question I think that our culture faces today is why? Why do we blame capitalism? Why do we blame free markets? Because there's a consequence. If capitalism is at fault, we need to do away with it. If free markets are problematic, we need to increase regulations of them. We need to increase control. We need to grow government. If markets can't deal with the economy, then the answer has to be somehow that government can deal with it. So 
the fact that we blame markets, the fact that we blame it during the 30s and the fact that we blamed it, you know, every financial, every crisis since then, and the fact that we're blaming markets today has real consequences to our freedoms, to our rights. Because if leaving us free somehow is a disaster, somehow creates this catastrophe where people can't find jobs and people are, you know, there's no health care and there's no, you know, there's no economic growth, then government has to step in supposedly and fix it all. And we need more and more and more government, which is what we're seeing right now. And the reason they can get away with it is because people are bought into the notion that markets don't work. And they haven't, I believe now, economics is a complex science and so on, but I don't think they've bought into markets don't work because somebody's found an economic fallacy in the theory of free market economics. The theory of free market economics is very solid. It's not well understood out there, but it is solid. You know, whether it's Hayek, von Mises, and the many, many other really, really great free market economists that have existed, they built a solid economic foundation for the understanding of how free markets work. And yet, we still blame them. And it's not just that we blame capitalism. It's the fact that the so-called defenders of capitalism won't stand up and say, no, it wasn't capitalism. No, it's government that caused this crisis. You, you don't see that. We're, we're, you know, how many people on television do that? How many economists go out there who should know better and defend capitalism? How many politicians do you see standing up? I mean, even the Republicans. From McCain to Palin, I guess that's a from to from. You know, <laughs> blamed Wall Street for the crisis. I mean, everybody does. And yet you think that people would know better. And this is not new. The defenders of capitalism over the last you know, 100 years have been weak. Other than the economists who do a good job describing it, you don't find many people with a passion about capitalism, with an excitement about defending it. You know, the best you get is, is, a, is a famous book that came out in the 1980s. Uh, by Irving Kristol. I'm sure you, you all know uh, you're Bill Kristol's father. For those of you who watch a lot of television, Bill on, was on last night commenting on the elections. Uh, Irving Kristol wrote regularly in the Wall Street Journal and considered a huge defender of capitalism. In the 80s, he wrote a book called Two Cheers for Capitalism. Now, if the Black Hawks win tonight, how many cheers are you going to give them? <laughs> two? No. I mean, you don't give two to something you like, you give three. Right? Working on a book now called The Third Cheer for Capitalism. So <laughs> fix, fix the uh, injustice that, that uh, uh, Irvin committed. And Crystal said, look, we get it. Capitalism works. It provides the goods. It creates the wealth. It builds prosperity. It creates jobs. We know that. No question about that. Cheer number one. He said, we know capitalism is consistent with political freedom. Typically, not always, but in most places where you get somewhat free markets, you also get a movement towards political freedom. That's a good thing. Political freedom is a good thing. Cheer number two. That there's something about capitalism that I just can't get comfortable with to give it a third cheer. Because what's capitalism about? What's capitalism about? What are free markets? People out there in the free markets, what are they about? What are they doing? What was that? Yeah, money. They're out for profit, but not just money, right? Uh, I like to use my iPhone as an example. Um, why does Steve Jobs make this? And I guess this is the old version, so I should be. <laughs> in a few weeks, I'll show you the, four, four, uh, the, fourth, the fourth generation. Why does he make the iPhone? Why do he make the iPhone? Well, because he's got, got a passion for efficient, beautiful products. He likes, he wants to see, for his own pleasure and his own satisfaction, his vision come to reality and be successful in the marketplace. So it's not just about money, but those passions, that vision is whose? It's Steve Jobs's. You know, so being, it's about Steve. And by the way, he also makes a lot of money off the iPhones. The profit margin is well over 50%. If you, you know, if you wanted to maximize social utility, he could have sold it to me for a lot cheaper. 
But that's not what he's about. He's about Steve Jobs. He's about Apple. It's about self-interest. And when I went to the mall and bought this, I was doing it to stimulate the economy. <laughs> that's why you go to the mall, right? You buy those nice clothes and, and other stuff to stimulate the economy. You, no, I mean, you go to the mall, why? Because you want to buy cool stuff for you. You want to be dressed nicely for you, for your own satisfaction. You want to buy products that make you more efficient, more productive, you know, have more fun with. It's all about you, you, you. Me, 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 right? It's about being self-interested. Capitalism is a system of self-interest. It's a system that allows self-interest to flourish, to be rewarded. If you make a lot of money for your firm, you get a nice bonus. If you create great products, you gain self-esteem from the fact that you've created something really worthwhile and successful. You benefit directly from your own actions. It's a system that rewards, incentivizes, and encourages self-interested behavior. It's all about, as consumers, as producers, as employees, as bosses, as in a marketplace. It's all about individuals' pursuit of self-interest. And yet, what do we know about self-interest? What do we think about self-interest as a culture? And you know, people say, oh, they do it for the profit, and they snick a little bit because it's a little uncomfortable to talk about profits in a positive way. Because we have this, you know, self-interest is kind of a yucky type of concept. Right? We all do it, but we don't want to admit it. Right? I mean, Bill Gates, take Bill Gates. He has a, you know, he had this phenomenal career. He built up this company. He made tens of billions of dollars for himself. You know, created millions of jobs. We are all enormous beneficiaries of the fact that we're networked, that we share, you know, in spite of the fact that I use apples, that we share a platform, that the internet can exist because there's a common language, which to a large extent is a result of this common platform, and so on and so on, right? And yet, when Bill Gates was creating all that money and was rising and was the richest man in the world and so on, what was the public's view of Bill Gates? Eh, there's something wrong here. We don't, you know, he might be a good businessman, but... This is all about him. This is all about making money. This is all about Bill Gates. And now, now he's not doing that anymore. He's giving it all away. What's the public perception of him? He's a saint. They love him. He's a good guy. In America today, making wealth is boring, neutral, or bad. Right? Giving it away, that's virtuous. That's good. That's wonderful. So participating in capitalism, that's no good. Participating in creating stuff and creating wealth and engaged in the marketplace, no good. Or at best, kind of neutral. I knew uh, two, uh, two friends who, uh, who uh, got a, a degree in computer engineering, and their passion was to start a company uh, and to build a product, you know, to be the next Steve Jobs or my, you know, the you know, or, or uh, Microsoft, or, you know, one of these companies, and, and they, they pursued their studies with passion, and yet, when they graduated, one of them went and did that and was very successful and ultimately took his company pri uh, public and, and made quite a bit of money. And the other one said, look, I be taught when I was little, little not, to do what's in my self-interest, but you know, I need to give back, I need to contribute, and um, so I'm gonna give up this passion, I'm gonna put this aside, and I'm gonna go to Africa and do my thing in Africa and so on. And he, went, and he goes and he joins whatever nonprofit organization there, and he does what he does, and they come back for a school reunion 10 years later, and the one guy's a you know, multimillionaire, and the other guy's just been to Africa as a volunteer and so on. Everybody wants to be the millionaire, right? But who does everybody think is the good guy? from an ethical moral perspective. 